Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing critical thinking and current issues in mental health. A typical definition of critical thinking is the analysis and evaluation of factual evidence to form judgment. My definition through a lens of mental health for critical thinking is the analysis and evaluation of factual and intuitive evidence to form discernment. Highly sensitive people and survivors are easily manipulated because of their big empathy and big hearts. It's why so many of us have narcissistic patterns of attraction. So we need to be able to practice discernment and we need to be able to critically think appropriately to be able to get to discernment. The end goal of critical thinking is to be able to make really great decisions for our lives and hopefully decisions that bring lightness and ease, not unnecessary struggle. This is part of why it's a pretty big deal for a highly sensitive person or a survivor to learn how to heal and manage anxiety and fear because anxiety and fear shut down or override our intuitive information and our best critical thinking. Now, y'all know that we can say that every single family out there has some dysfunction. And this is true. But there are different levels of dysfunction. And no, it's not a contest. But if you come from a moderate to a severely dysfunctional family background, then critical thinking might be even harder. In my own family of origin and extended family of origin, there really is a lot of good. I didn't go no contact because of the good. I went no contact because of some toxicity. But the good was, my family is funny. They're hardworking. And as a tribe, they value gathering and seeing each other, showing up for each other. But also in my family system, there's a real low value on self-reflection and learning. There's a lot of ego involved in, I'm never wrong. I heard a lot of, because I said so, or that's the way it's always been. That's common phrases. It made critical thinking and true learning outside of comfort zones nearly impossible. And it means that as a child, I didn't see people developing past their comfort zone. Even when things didn't work and there might have been a better way, there was no self-reflection to invite a new or different or better way. There seemed to be a drive to not critically think about certain things. Because to critically think about certain things means that our ego doesn't like it. Because to internalize new information and change our minds, for the ego, it means, hey, ego, you were wrong about some things. And the ego doesn't say thank you when we point that out. It bristles. It doesn't like it. It was very frustrating for me to see people that I loved refusing to critically think. So it became increasingly important to me to value critical thinking. As a highly sensitive person, I certainly value my emotions, but I also know that sometimes my feelings are liars. I've learned through decades now of hard work how to listen to my intuitive voice and how that voice is different from my logical or my critical voice. I don't see many schools or parenting teaching or modeling enough critical thinking. Here is an anonymous quote that I found that makes the point. Good critical thinking includes recognizing good arguments even when we disagree with them and poor arguments even when these support our own point of view. I want to share some tips and ideas to consider to increase 
critical thinking and discernment in your own life. To be able to critically think well, we really have to be able to observe with a wide lens and a zoomed in lens, not one or the other. Oftentimes when we witness people arguing or debating in modern life, they're arguing with a very zoomed in or a very wide lens and not considering the other perspective. We need perspective at the micro and the macro level. This is important to notice as we move through the world. I tend to be open to the possibility of trusting someone who shows me that they're willing to see the big picture and the small detail. We can learn to be curious over righteous. And this allows us to truly listen. You ever had a conversation with somebody who's righteous about whatever they're talking about? I'd bet good money that you didn't feel very heard to any points that you raised. There's not a lot of room to communicate with righteousness. So we bring in curiosity. We learn to be more curious than righteous. And this allows ourselves to listen. In a good argument, each side knows how to frankly shut up a little bit and honestly listen, honestly consider, and marinate in what the other side presents. We barely see people dip their little finger into what the opposition presents. But we want to marinate in this. We don't have to marry somebody else's perspective or opinion or idea or point of view. But we might be surprised at what we see if we actually give ourselves a chance to kind of sit with it and let it marinate. This is why I'm against the misinformation narrative, because few things are 100% right or 100% wrong. And we shut down exploration when we give our government power to decide what is good information and what is bad information, what is misinformation and what is true information. To explore, we have to go through the crap to get to what is golden, not eradicate the crap. Crap turns into good fertilizer to grow better ideas. And I think I can prove that to you right now, at least a little bit. Think about a brainstorming activity where we take out a piece of paper and we just sort of word dump and brain dump all of our ideas. Think about if you're trying to figure out a good gift for somebody in your life. If we start kicking around some ideas, it's likely that a lot of those ideas are going to be bad ideas at first. We've got to be willing to let the crappy ideas flow and get them out of the way. And that's how we hone in on the better ideas. Now imagine if I gave you the task of brainstorming in this way. Brainstorm some gift ideas for Phil the Mailman. But imagine if I gave you the directive, no, you can't get it wrong, but go ahead and brainstorm. Do you see how that would sort of clog up the works? We really might need bad ideas too, to get things flowing, to get to the better ideas. Another thing we can do to grow our critical thinking, we can evaluate evidence and evaluate it. That's from a very logical place or an intuitive place. But we don't want to bring over emotion to an evaluation. We just want to observe very matter-of-factly. We want to evaluate the evidence that's being presented And sometimes even more importantly, the evidence that's left out, that's not said. Sometimes what is not said can be very, very important. And if I'm watching someone debate, I'm looking to hear messages like, hmm, okay, I'll need to consider that because that was a good point I had not yet considered. I'm going to look into that more. Or thank you for that new insight. That is a good point to consider. And if these things are not said or not acknowledged, that the other side ever makes a decent point, I'm not going to trust that person that can't say that so much. 
I take note. When someone can say, ah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. This communicates openness, listening. It's an openness instead of a closedness. It's a maturity. It shows that this person is willing to adjust and amend their ideas as they add to new information. It shows that they have insight. It shows that they know how to manage their ego enough to not have to be right and push away new insights and new information. That's a person that I'm going to consider listening to their ideas and growing my wisdom with by learning from them. In critical thinking, we learn to consider bias while not using bias to dismiss. Confirmation bias is when we have confirmed our thoughts based on prior experience, which basically means we aren't really open to new information. We tend to play I spy with confirmation bias. It's like, I believe that recycling is good. Therefore, I'm going to look for information that supports the idea that recycling is good. And I'm going to reject any information that says recycling might not be as great as I want it to be. That's confirmation bias. One of the things that seems to have entered the collective unconscious is this new way of sort of nonchalantly and cheaply spitting out that someone is transphobic. There's even a confirmation bias in that because that's a big thing to throw at somebody. That one conversation or one idea can't really confirm. The same people who don't want hate speech can cheerily paint an entire person with an oversimplified hate brush of, oh, that person disagrees with this, therefore they're transphobic. And we're seeing this cognitive bias everywhere as whole groups of people are labeled as racists, bigots, and now groomers based solely on disagreeing. Cognitive bias is someone cherry picking information to support the ideas. If you really think someone is transphobic, it would serve you to look for the ways that they may show that they're very much trans supportive. Because the truth is probably somewhere in the middle in this modern society. Most people, if they have proper empathy, want other people to be happy in their own skin and in their lives and to have whatever they need to be better or content or fulfilled and to be safe and to feel safe. Cognitive bias is very closed and limiting. It's kind of cheap. There's so much to learn from people who disagree, but it does take a maturity. And when we talk maturity, that's not a dig. Maturity really takes time and experience and insight to bake up our human maturity. So no wonder this is more of a youthful trend. I imagine that as youth grows up and out of this, we'll see some of that fall away. In critical thinking, we do well to keep our own egos in check. If we're arguing appropriately, respectful disagreement is invited. It's allowed. We learn to cultivate an ability to agree to disagree and still be respectful of each other's humanity, of our ideas, of our individual personhood, and our difference. The more that we do this, the more that we're practicing maturity in action. I think it's the inner child in all of us that can just kind of look at somebody and be like, you're stupid. I don't like that. And just kind of shut down like you're dumb. I don't want to hear it. To mature ourselves, we can't let that part of ourselves drive the car of our life. We can't let that part lead discussions about heavy topics, about nuanced topics, complicated, complex layered, deep topics. In healthy critical thinking, we're learning to distinguish fact from opinion. And my goodness, has media and social media and the internet distorted fact and opinion. One of the most surprising things about my college experience to me now is how tough my school was on what was a valid source 
and what was not a valid source. When I was in college, I started in 1998 and I didn't finish till 2006. Every single thing that I wrote for every single class for both degrees, no internet written article was allowed as valid. Not one. Only published journals. Professors that I counsel and coach now over the past few years have brought to my attention that journals who previously could be trusted to only print provable, and by provable, I mean repeatable studies, have started printing full-on biased opinion. This is dangerous. This is not critical thinking. This is biased thinking. This is pushing agendas. This is disregarding and disrespecting principles of science, scientific method. In critical thinking, we evaluate validity. And validity is one of those words that clinically has a definition, but in common vernacular in the way that we just speak to each other kind of holds a, a different definition. We can hear a lot of people. It's a common thing to say to whatever feeling someone is having. Oh, well, that's valid. That's valid. Whatever you're feeling is valid. It's become normalized. The actual definition of valid in this way is defined as the quality of being logically or factually sound. And when we really think about that when it comes to feelings, my feelings are not facts. So it's interesting that we have paired this word valid with our emotions. In a psychological clinical sense, validity is a statistical term. And it means a test is valid if it measures what it claims to measure. We want to invite into our analysis different views and perspectives, interpretations, and lenses. And invite is the key word there. If you are debating, if you are having healthy argument, then you are inviting these different perspectives. Why? Well, we seem to have developed a culture of eco chambers. And in eco chambers, it's very common that you only get acceptance when you practice and preach what the eco chamber allows. And by design, if people grow or change or evolve their beliefs, their ideas, they're very likely bullied for those emerging differences. If we don't invite alternative perspectives and views into our argument inside of ourselves and when we're talking to other people, then it means that we're putting that oppositional view, that difference in a position to have to fight us to be heard or let into a conversation. This is not good argument. Teenagers, if you're out there trying to argue with your parents for a later curfew, if you want to be more successful negotiating with your parents, ask them questions in earnest about why they want you home by, let's say it's midnight. Help them feel heard, listened to, respected. And then ask them to listen and hear you respectfully. Ask them to listen to your pitch and then give them a pitch about why it should be a different time. And then be open and willing to negotiate or surrender because they are in charge till you move out and on to your next adulting phase. If you do this, you might not get what you want. But what you will be doing is you will be communicating through your behavior, your words, your actions, your tone, your listening skills. You will be communicating that you are maturing right before their eyes which is exactly what you need to show if you want a later curfew. So when you're zoomed in to just that moment, just arguing for Saturday night, you might not be able to see the zoomed out picture. And if you zoom out, it's not just about the next Saturday. It's about how they will see you the next month and the next three months and the next six, nine and 12 months. Think of all the things you're going to have to negotiate. Isn't it time you showed them that you're maturing to a better position so that you can negotiate what you want as you age up and out? 
Critical thinking will make you a better negotiator. The ego tends to have a mistaken belief that if you actually slow down, humble yourself a little bit and listen that you'll be losing or giving something up, our egos are wrong. We win so much more respect, humility, connection between people when we use these critical thinking skills in our arguments, in our debates, in our negotiations. We want to be able to reach reasonable conclusions based on our individual reasoning. And we need to allow human difference versus fighting or righteously dominating that difference. We learn to accept unknowns or enoughness and just move life forward. We make educated guesses after we gather some information because we can't gather all the information and we need life to move forward in a reasonable way. This doesn't make having a hunch or an intuitive pull the same as proving your point in a debate. But for people who struggle with perfectionism and struggle with wanting to know, this is a very important permission to allow as part of our critical thinking that we can't do it perfectly and exactly and completely. So there has to be permission to move forward and make reasonable conclusions. We want to question things, but with integrity. We don't want to question to confuse the opponent or overwhelm the opponent or derail the conversation or distract or dismiss or disrespect. A question is a gathering tool. A question is used to collect more and different knowledge. Don't disrespect the art of the question, man or woman. We can ask questions with integrity and groundedness. The better our critical thinking skills get, the more that we fine tune them, the better our problem solving skills. And if you haven't figured it out yet, being a human is about figuring things out constantly. You think there's any downside to increasing your critical thinking skills? The only one I can think of is your tribe might not like it if they're not also practicing critical thinking skills. You may learn that you have some people in your world, or maybe you're one of those people that just kind of want to be enabled. And critical thinking is hard. It's challenging. It makes us have to change our minds, adjust, and tweak And our egos really like to settle and grip, hone in, sit on our ideas like a chicken on eggs. We don't want to go anywhere. One of my beliefs about highly sensitive people is that we're reluctant leaders, almost all of us. And I know that's a big thing for me to say. I know a lot of you out there are hearing that going, not me. I don't want to run anything. Thanks. (laughs) But we are the reluctant leaders. Very few of us want to elbow in and take charge or get loud. But if we're maturing ourselves, if we're attempting to lean into critical thinking, if we're involved in betterment and self-development, if we have a strong sense of fairness and trying to empathically get everyone's needs met, then we really do have the stuff that it takes to make for a really great leader. Some of you as moms are leading your household. Some of you as dads are leading your household. Some of you as entrepreneurs are leading your teams. Some of you as salesmen or different kinds of workers are leading your team or mentoring an individual. I can't let this episode go without talking about framing. And I'm going to use gender to talk about framing. Framing is very important to understand when it comes to critical thinking. Y'all know, if you've listened to more than a handful of episodes, you know I reject victim mentality as a frame. When it comes to gender issues and kids, the framing of the argument as affirm your kid or your kid will kill themselves is a very dangerous frame. Not only is it a dangerous frame, but that statement presented it in an all or nothing black or white way to a parent is a trap. It is a form of emotional blackmail. This frame 
parallels when people with borderline personality disorder say during a breakup, if you break up with me, I will kill myself. We don't make decisions based on that threat. And when we do, we are reinforcing that that threat is useful and workable. And we invite more of that threat, not less. It's a frame that shuts down critical thinking and evaluation due to fear. And now we've added a potential shaming, a potential being ousted by the accepted group stance to affirm that's being touted by doctors, psychologists, and therapists. This is happening across our country when it comes to very young children transitioning. The push to make asking questions akin to conversion therapy is a dangerous shutdown of critical thinking. Even in the mental health profession, where we are trained to go deeper and ask questions. I mean, that's the whole therapeutic gig, you guys. So the fact that that is being shut down in so many states and that therapists like me are being put in a position where we may be ostracized for asking the very questions we were taught to ask and that we know are good, important questions to be able to critically think about this issue. I have known that there are problems in mental health since I first dipped my toe into this profession, but I am shocked at how far this has gone. Since this trend has emerged, I've witnessed people personally and professionally transition, have surgeries, remove breasts, people that I know who were repeatedly sexually assaulted and sometimes violently over and over and over again. They've left working with me to work with therapists that would affirm them. And yes, I am scared that they have changed their bodies without proper mental health care asking the critical thinking questions. People who are asking questions, there's nothing about asking a question that makes someone against anybody else. Sadly, there's not enough critical thinking being employed as adults make decisions that forever change a child's life. Some of the hormone blockers, the puberty blockers, have the side effect when you block puberty of blocking the development of the sexual characteristics that allow for orgasm. The most famous trans child who has their own show on TLC has publicly reported that to this day, at the age of 21, she cannot and never has had an orgasm. We need a whole lot of critical thinking around these decisions being made for children. As someone who has historically signed off on many top surgeries with joy and support, someone who has taken resistant and angry and confused parents into their office to advocate for their trans clients. I can't do my work if I don't ask the deep, hard questions. Anyone out there considering medicating your child for gender and any mental health issue, if you are critically thinking instead of being motivated by fear or potential shame or rejection from a group, I strongly encourage you to engage professionals who think differently for at least a second opinion and to gather a third, a fourth, and a fifth opinion before undergoing anything that can permanently alter a child. A child's brain develops till about 25, and there are not sufficient studies on the long-term effects of transitioning gender we don't know what will happen to the adult body of children that go through that. They're going through it right now. We're going to know in 10 and 20 and 30 years. But we just don't know yet. We need to ask these hard questions. Therapists that are out there who are resonating with what I'm saying, stay strong to your ethics instead of these narratives that you see being popularized. Critical thinking has to be a big, important part of mental health. It has to be. I hope there's something in this episode that helps you see yourself or the world with more clarity, that helps you hold yourself with more self-respect, maturity, self-regard, and development. We get this one precious life. If each of us takes on the personal responsibility of healing ourselves, 
this is how we heal the world. I hope that you feel more empowered to lean into some critical thinking that may not be so popular, that may not be so well received. As always, take what works for you and leave the rest. There are so many ways that this audience shows up to support Emotional Badass supporting you. When you sign up for our Patreon, you get all of the content. You get access to every single exclusive episode. It's nowhere else. It's not on our website. It's not on the iTunes feed. It's not on iHeartRadio. It's not on Pandora. It's not on Spotify. They are only on Patreon. And when you throw us five bucks a month, you get access to all of those episodes immediately. At the $10 level, you can submit a question that I will answer in our video live stream, and you can come hang out with me live as I answer your question. The questions are always deep, honest, authentic, insightful. I'm so grateful for all of you there that hold space for your own healing, for everybody else's healing, and for me to be able to do some video stuff and play off your energy because you're there live. It's a different format than me alone on this microphone. When you join at the $10 level, you get over a 100 hours of content. And the reason that I put this content out there is because we need to immerse ourselves in it. We need to marinate in it. We need to hear some of these things over and over and over again. Not because we're dense, but because we're working at the level of the subconscious mind. And we have to hear things over and over and over again until all of a sudden it's as if our subconscious mind goes, oh, is this the new thing you want me to feel and practice? And we say, yes, subconscious mind, that's why I've been working on this stuff so hard. And it goes, oh, okay. And at that point, it's easier. So if you'd like to come immerse yourself in the Patreon, come hang out there. It's also where we give the biggest discount codes to anything and everything that we offer. You'll find a little discount code for our stripped down meditations that you can find on our website and you'll get the biggest discount to the boundaries course. And thank you all for being on the planet with me. I so appreciate sharing the planet with other people that are growing. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets mindful light and love and I will see you right here next time with a brand new episode bye bye